This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Mike Dever. This is his fourth appearance on this podcast. I hope I've got that right. He was actually the first interview on my trend following podcast. Most appreciative to actually be the person that might trust me in 2012 that it would be okay to come on and talk. Big shout out to Mike for that. Today in 2022, Mike and I catch up to talk trading, markets, life. A quant perspective, a quant thinking. If you can't learn something from a guy like Mike Dever, well, maybe you're already a billionaire. Maybe you've already made it. But for us mortals who still want to grab some insights, listen to some of that wisdom for a man who's been on Wall Street for 40 plus years, Mike brings the goods. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So Mike is a guy who perhaps your trading goes back earlier for your professional career, your company, Brandywine, going back to 1982. That's what we're looking for, four decades of experience in the markets as an investment professional. Okay, Mike, give me your best take. Where are we in 2022? What should we be thinking about? This is a big open-ended question. <laughs> But where are we right now contrasted to this four decades of experience that you have in the markets? Very interesting because I started trading in 79, formed Brandywine in 1982. When I started, we we're in the midst of the big commodity bull market. Gold was running up to $800, silver $40, $50. Diamonds were going up the price. Everything was going up. It was a highly speculative environment. The Fed in the U.S. wrung that out. I wrote in one of our monthly reports at the end of last year that I felt we were in the most speculative environment that I had seen in my entire investment career. I still feel we've got a lot of that to ring out. When you had not just stocks going up, but you had residential real estate, you had crypto, you had NFTs, you had SPACs. There were just all sorts of ways people were learning, eagerly jumping into ways to speculate on different prices, all bullish trends, commodities were skyrocketing. I feel like we're still in that mode, but we're at a transition where the world starts to realize you can't monetize debt and that it does lead to inflation. And there are some serious dislocations in the financial markets when you do that. I think we're in a period similar to where we were in the early 1980s with a change in the regime. Right now, if we look at equities, U.S. equities, some individual names have taken it on the chin, big time, the Netflixes of the world. But overall, the broad indexes, minus 15 to 20%, somewhere in that neighborhood, 20%. In real estate in the States, I guess there's probably some pockets in some of the high-flying areas, but has real estate really taken it on the chin? Yet? The reason I say all this is because if we had to put this into the innings are we in the first inning, the second inning? And this is not a prediction. This is just two guys talking about an interesting period of time where there's been a heck of a lot of volatility and a heck of a lot of big moves. By no means am I trying to get you to make a prediction or anything like that. Let me push you a little bit more about how you feel where we are. It's a prediction, but I feel like we're in the early part of the game. Maybe it's even the bottom of the first where we've made a move. Somebody's come out, they've taken their shot, they've swung the bat. That's the Fed saying, okay, we're going to tighten. We've still got just global excess, still like crazy. When you talk about real estate, people are talking about a waning of the increases in the prices of residential real estate. They're not talking about prices falling and even offsetting price rises that just went up even last year. They're just saying instead of going up 15, 20%, you know, maybe they're only going to go five or 10 this year. I think we're really early on. If we're not, Instead, we go to this one of these extensions where we continue to allow 
monetary and fiscal easing to stimulate markets, it stretch the game. At some stage of the game, you got to pay the piper. I mean, the bill comes due. You would think. $9 trillion on the Fed balance sheet. Japan has essentially monetized their entire economy. Japanese government owning a big chunk of the Japanese stock market. And we're seeing that globally. I think there's a lot that's been swept under the rug in China. I just think there's a lot of unwinding that needs to take place. We're in the early innings of that. Something I love that you say in your work, and you say it a lot, and it will cause some people to immediately go, oh yeah, that's a very prescient thing to say. It's very wise. Other people are going to be like, hold on, I'm not a market timer. Mike, you would say, hold on, everybody, everybody's a market timer, whether you know it or not. Why do I let you explain that? Every time people have sold, it hasn't been at the peak of the markets. It's been at a trough. That's what's helped create the troughs around the way down. They get back in and they've missed a big chunk of the gains they would have had had they merely stayed in the market. Right now, the monitor's out there. It's just buy and hold and hang into the market. Of course, at some point, everybody needs to sell something, either for retirement or whatever. Friends of mine that are in their late 80s that are still riding stocks aggressively because they don't want to give up the opportunity for further gains, even though it won't change your lifestyle. But if they collapse, it absolutely will change your lifestyle. That's how strictly entrenched this mantra is now. You're making a timing decision. You know you're going to have to sell these at some point to live off of in your retirement, but you're still holding these positions in perpetuity. So that's a time decision. You decided to hold. The other way that I look at it is that when people are not looking at various markets, they're not trading in so many of the opportunities that are out there available for them to have money invested into it, that's a decision. You choose not to make an investment in those markets. That's a timing decision. You've sold, you haven't bought it at all. Everything gets down to being a timing decision. It's just a matter of what your time frame is going to be on that. Let's be practical. Let's be objective about that. Because when you do that, then you can come up with ways to actually properly time the market that aren't just based on the fact that I'm retiring now. So I need to get out of things or I panic. So I've lost 50% or 70% in something and I want to get out of this now. Set up something objective in advance. You say it, and I love the way you explain this. You've just obviously laid it out. So I'll give the big example, Warren Buffett as a market timer. Now let's say you, Mike, were in the audience at that Omaha event that he does every year with Charlie Munger, and you had a chance to come up to the microphone. You said, hey, hold on, Warren, you and Charlie are market timers. Now, they might scoff at you and they might try to give some witticism at first, but if you have the chance to explain it, do you think they agree with you? I think it goes counter to their brand. From that standpoint, I think there would absolutely be resistance to agreeing with me. Obviously, they're buying opportunistically and they're selling opportunistically. And that's something they've done throughout their careers. And they've done it very successfully. It really just reinforces what I say is that I have some sort of a plan. What is it you're looking for that you want to own? And when is it that you may decide you don't want to own that any longer? What kind of criteria do you have in place to help you make those decisions in an objective fashion? So in the heat of the moment, you're not making an emotional decision. That's exactly what they do. I don't know that they would probably even engage that as an answer. They might deflect that into some sort of that politically correct response because their brand is not to be market timing and they absolutely don't want to preach that to the everyday person. First six months of 2022, systematic traders, trend following traders, quants, people that are trading markets with a fixed set of rules, opportunistic across whatever markets are trending. Pretty historical first six months, huh? Phenomenal period. Oh yeah, great trends. I look at some of the performance numbers from some of the pro CTAs and whatnot. It shocks me that, I mean, I don't watch CNBC on any kind of regular basis at all. I don't think the performance that you and I are seeing and other people are seeing is getting any coverage at all. And it's just phenomenal. Here you have one side of the ledger, people just something like crypto going up in smoke, many individual equities having all kinds of trouble, the broad indices taking a shot on the chin, obviously all kinds around the globe, other currencies beyond the dollar are taking it on the chin. The people that are taking advantage of all of these moves, it's like the system doesn't want to talk about that, does it? It does not. It's really interesting when you have conventional 
financial press and financial market, it's still dominated by people owning equities, being long equities. It's something that when I wrote about that a decade ago in my book, I talked about how by being so focused, they're not truly diversifying their portfolios. It's so easy to kind of step back and look at it that there's ways to get better returns on an absolute and risk-adjusted basis by properly diversifying. And essentially, modern portfolio theory actually preach that. They just constrain themselves to asset classes when they preach that. But if you go across return drivers and look at all these different markets and opportunities that you have, these trend-following traders in a lot of these commodity markets, financial markets in the first half of this year did phenomenally well just simply by trading a handful of return drivers, really momentum-based return drivers in a broad base of markets to earn those types of returns. It's so obvious that's beneficial, but it's different. And people don't view risk as being what we view it as, the financial risk of taking a position. They view risk as being different from what other people are doing. And the more different you are, the more risky that is in their mind. I think that's the issue that we have here, certainly with the financial press. I think it's a perfect opportunity to let you take the floor since you've used the word. Maybe I've already used it too. I might have already forgotten. The word risk. How do you define the word risk? Risk is really defined by not achieving what your requirements are. We look at it in certain ways with our trading. And a lot of times people will take it and say, well, it's volatility. It's market drawdown. Those are some very standard ways of measuring that. The reality is you've got a reason that you are investing, whether it's for retirement, it's for college planning for your children or for yourself, you've got a purchase that you're looking to make, something like that. Risk is really defined by your probability of achieving that. The lower probability of achieving what that goal is, the higher the risk that you're taking. In my mind, it's you've got a certain number of years to live. What is your probability of outliving that with your savings? By remaining in those positions, you're increasing the risk that you're going to outlive that money figuring out what it is you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are, what you need, and then targeting a profile that can get you there with the lowest probability that it's not going to get you there. You mentioned some of the older investors, let's say over 80, 70s, whatnot, that are not understanding their risks and they are perhaps still up to their gills and tech stocks. This fear of missing out thing that you're supposed to have at a much younger age, you would think the older folks might kind of sit back and say, I've got enough. I wonder if this is generational. I wonder if there's a baby boomer thing, not with you, but I wonder if there's a baby boomer thing going on right now where there's a certain cockiness. The baby boomers have not relinquished power, so to speak. I mean, they still run the show. They run the politics. They have the wealth. It is kind of fascinating that people that don't seem to know that they're not going to live forever. They're at the casino still, like when they were 45 years of age. It's quite fascinating to me. It's interesting you say how the older generation, the baby boomers are still running the show because when we look back at the Reagan election in 1980, people were very critical about his age. And now we're electing people who are older than he was when he left office. There is this hanging on of that cohort, that whole age group, and I think there is a lot of confidence that they've gained because when you're at the top of an equity bull market, any decision you made to sell was probably wrong because it's very unlikely that you sold at a prior peak and bought in at the prior bottom. You probably sold in one of the prior bottoms or on the way down, certainly near the bottom. They have a lot of confidence that things will continue just to go the way they're going to go. And that's something you see with everybody. They've had longer, they've had more decades to have that reinforced. I see the same thing though with the younger groups. A lot of the young tech savvy investors that are in there today are still very aggressive equity buyers, even after some of their stocks have gotten 50% or more. You see that. The numbers show that the ARC fund had one and a half billion dollars in inflows in the first half of this year. Now that's a fund that's down 50% on the year and over 70% off its peak. Everybody's viewing that as a buying opportunity, not as an opportunity to panic. Historically, 20 years ago, people would have panicked out of that, but it's taken a lot more to get people to panic. I don't know that that's a good sign that you're seeing inflows. To me, that means you're probably still not near bottom. 
to them, it means they've, they've been very smart and not having panicked out of it. It is quite interesting, this idea that people are willing to take drawdowns, to speak in trend-following parlance for a second, people are willing to take these drawdowns that 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, that's too volatile. And then crypto comes along and an entire generation is like, hey, we've got a badge on our chest. We just took a drawdown of 80% and we did it six times in five years. And I'm thinking to myself, this is kind of loony. The strategy of taking 80% drawdowns or whatever is loopy. <laughs> Am I crazy? You definitely have multiple standards. As we've seen it with trend following, with some of the managed futures industry, if you have a 20, 25% drawdown, people walk away. It's too much. I don't know how many times I've talked with investors or investment banks, some of the big professionals, professional investors over the decades that have said, well, we don't want to be in anything that's going to have a double digit drawdown. Yet they're heavily exposed in tech stocks and riding 50% drawdowns. In their mind, that's not risky because they will come back. Sometimes you have multiple decades, stock like Cisco that still is working its way back. It's worked well enough, often enough, that's reinforced that behavior. Crypto is that because crypto has those 80% drawdowns and then turns around and has a thousand percent return. And then has a 50% drawdown, has another thousand percent return. It's constantly coming back and hitting new highs some of those cryptos go to zero, though. Bitcoin's a survivor. Ethereum's a survivor. Some of them are going to zero. Absolutely. You've got 10,000 plus, close to 20,000 of these different tokens that are out there. Big, substantial portion of them won't be worth anything. We understand you've made this multi-generational wealth in a matter of years on a very small $7,000 initial investment turned into tens of millions of dollars. And we understand that has you not beholden, but totally convinced that this is the right way to go. You would have never held through those prior losses had you not been a firm believer all the way through. And that's what you see plenty of times. People at those peaks will never sell because they would have never been at that peak had they sold ever prior. But our point was that you have to realize how exceptional this is in world history to have a market instrument like this that has gone up tens of thousands of times in a decade, how exceptional that is, and recognize that the same exceptional behavior could take that back to zero. Not saying it will, just saying it's a non-zero probability. So plan for that. Have some protection in place that if that happens, you haven't done a round trip on all the money you've made. It kind of leads into your statement about playing defense, whatever sport analogy we might want to use. Playing defense as a first move versus only going up to, and if I use a baseball analogy, only going up to the plate, only trying to Babe Ruth it every time. The idea of controlling your downside, playing some defense, you know, there's a lot of logic there, but I guess for you, and you've seen this a lot more than myself, getting that message across to people can be difficult. It is. People like to swing for the fences, especially when markets are moving higher and they're bullish and long. Nobody wants to think about that downside to it. In fact, what we're seeing today is markets that have sold off and people rushing in to buy more because now it's an opportunity. Just over this weekend, how many articles I've seen where people are saying these are individuals in the market, some institutions as well, but individuals primarily that were saying that these stocks are discounted now. They're cheap because they're comparing it to what it was. I had this conversation with a woman that I helped coach Special Olympics. One of the, the athletes is talking about his Tesla stock. She's a big Tesla stock fan. It's just amazing what that company's done. It's truly astounding the way they've taken on the incumbents and dominating the industry and just totally transformed that industry. If you've got a stock that's trading at multiples, 10x of what some of the other competitors are in that industry, you got to recognize that it's expensive. For a time there, its price was greater, its capitalization, than the next 10 incumbents. Some of those are good companies that you know are going to give a pretty good fight in the electric car market going forward. She was making the point when it was down about 30% that it was cheap. And I said, well, it's cheaper than it was, but there's no reason that can't fall 50% or more. We've seen this historically. 
rather than thinking of how much more could go back up or how much it went down and that it's supposed to be back at that level again, you have to always be thinking of how low it could go. Make sure you protect yourself from riding that all the way down because it's a lot harder to come back than it is to go down. If I listen to Pragmatic You and I'm thinking the lady you just described and not picking on her and there's many people like it, but it's kind of like in my mind, choice is the way that you can live a life. You can have the lottery mindset or the non-lottery mindset. And it's amazing how many people living the life of a lottery mindset are some of the biggest, quote, achievers on the planet. But if you had to play the game out over many dice rolls, it could just as easily go the other way. That's a very difficult way to lead a life for me personally. Some people don't mind it at all. It's the most interesting chasm for me personally to look at people that live the life of a lottery mindset. Right. Today, th those people are on a pedestal. What people don't recognize is that there were probably a thousand other candidates to be on that pedestal that didn't make it. They made the same outrageous bets and they failed. They're relegated to some bottom rung that you don't even see. And then you've got the top performers, the Elon Musk of the world, who's you know, on the top right now, who made some wild, wild plays, very, very aggressive and was successful at it. They could have gone the other way. I mean, he came close multiple times to going the other way. He had probably no different perseverance or brilliance than a number of other people who didn't make it. He was just on the right side at those turning points in 2008, for example, or 2016, 17 period. He made it through and he made it to the next side. We see reports now where he was trying to sell his company to Apple for $50 million. He made it through that though. Now we're seeing him as being the richest man in the world. But again, it's an outlier. And when you make those kind of bets, the majority of the people that do that aren't ending up on top. They're still relegated to the bottom rung somewhere trying to climb back. It is fascinating the way you say it, that we've put these people and this mindset up on a pedestal. By no means are you nor I criticizing Elon Musk. It's cojones the size of you know what, and you've got to give him all the props for what he's done. It's amazing. But when you start to look at it from the standpoint of risk, dice rolls, odds, and probabilities, and statistics, we have to be honest about the discussion. Yes. And that's why I point out you're not talking about the other 999 out of 1,000 that were attempting, not necessarily in space and in cars and neural and the other things that he's involved in, solar, but attempting with different businesses or different companies, uh, rolling the dice as aggressively as he was, you don't hear about them because the odds of that working are very, very low. It worked for him. When you have a thousand people doing it, it's going to work for somebody. But those are more of what the odds really are, somewhere in that one in a thousand. You take those kind of risks, you roll that multifaceted dice, you're going to lose more often than you win. We just don't hear about the losers as consistently. If we take it a step back, though, if we say, okay, let's put Elon and his major outlier 300 billion fortune over to the side, and we were to say to uh, regular folks, hey, if you're starting at, frankly, zero or whatever, and you save some money, now you're going to start to invest, you're most likely not going to ever be Elon just, quote, investing in the markets without managing money for other people. However, if you are managing your own money, you can do significantly well. There's enough evidence out there that if you come to a guy like yourself, Mike, I want to learn, I want to understand how you've done it, there's opportunity out there to increase yourself. There's no way we can say, hey, you're going to be the next Elon. But if people can find their way to being a little more rational about what the opportunities in life are, there are some great opportunities in the markets with why strategies. There really are. I've talked to a number of people over the years who have done really well and then lost it. Do you have a number? I'm not asking names and I want you to put anybody in a position of feeling bad, but is there someone or an amount of money you can think of that you know that was at one time up here and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions lost? I know a couple, and these are just regular people who have day jobs that in different environments work great for them. I have one in particular 
his longtime friend at one point was worth well over $10 million, had a tech job. It worked well. He got stock in the company. The company went up and he never sold. Ultimately, it was a big fan-based company that collapsed. It never got the earnings to support the valuation. He kept all his chips on the table and took nothing off. He did because to him, it worked. This is the problem, I guess you see, is the people that are regular people that end up in those positions, they're in that position because they never sold on the way up. They never doubted. If they doubted, they wouldn't have ridden it. $10,000, $20,000 stock allocation to $10 million. They would have sold it at $1 million. They'd say, wow, I got so much already. I'm great. They keep riding it. And that's why those same people, at some point, ride it back down. Unless it's a real company that turns into some real value, and you've seen that with the Microsofts and Amazons of the world, a lot of the companies that have that kind of growth early on, it's because they get hyped up to that. They get a fan base that bids them up to that. It doesn't mean they're worth that. Because of that, though, they're bought in, or they wouldn't have held it that as long as they did. Because they're bought in, they never see the signal that says, it's time for me to get out. And what we talked about earlier, it goes from 10 million to 5 million. It's cheap in their mind now. It's not, hey, I better protect what I have left. It's, this is cheaper than it was three months ago. I'm, I'm not going to sell it now. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something from Bill Eckhart, where he talked about the utility of money and this very issue of you have a small amount of money that goes to a large amount of money. And sometimes it might sound crazy to someone listening who's not had that happen to them. Some people can get to that large amount of money and they don't appreciate the utility of where they have got to. They just don't have a plan for risk at all. And you give the example of what can happen. It's There's a big difference between $25,000 and $10 million. Big difference. Right. And there's a lot less difference for an individual between that $10 million and $100 million. They're not looking at whether it goes back to $25,000. they are looking at, made this much, I can get to $100 million now if I just keep doing something the same. And then the utility, the value of that next $90 million is nothing like it was for the first 10. The first 10 is generational. It's game-changing for them. It's lifestyle, complete transformation of their lifestyle. The next $90 million is not. It's not the same. They kind of assign the same value to it instead of looking at that big mismatch now they have between the positive outcome of making another 90 and the negative of giving back that 10 million that they collected. Especially if you're in a tech stock, you have to have joined a tech company, not necessarily a big name. It takes off. You got your 10 million, which was essentially, okay, you pick the right job. The markets liked it. It went up. Trying to imagine yourself going from 10 million, and we're all the hypothetical example here, the 10 million to 100 million, it's just all ego. It's not a plan, right? It pretty much is. Most likely, it's not a lifestyle changer for them at that point. Their lifestyle has already been changed. That doesn't make it any different. To do that is just to feel like they really were smart, that they stayed in it and they rode that. There's a lot of ego that's obviously involved in investing. The more it is, the less the probability that you're going to achieve your goals. Here I am talking to a quant guy, you, a guy that knows something about technology, something about computers. We sound like two psychologists all of a sudden. <laughs> When you get down to the investing world, that's 99% of the game, even when you're a quant guy. As a quant guy, you're developing strategies and you want them to work and you've got to constantly fight your ego to say, okay, am I trying to make this work or is this a strategy? Does it really have a sound logical premise? Is the return driver valid or do I want it to work? Because I invented this concept, this theory, this idea. Even as a quant guy, you're constantly battling the ego side and the emotional side of investing. As you just laid that out, I was thinking you're kind of describing the scientific method versus something else, the not scientific method, because the scientific method is exactly what you're describing. And the something else is what you're describing as well, too. Yes. As a quant, you have to apply the scientific method. I've seen a lot of people that try to do maybe more of a shortcut approach and some of the heavy data manipulation processes that look like they might work. In the end, if you don't start with a sound logical premise and then quantify and test that premise, you don't really know if that data that you mined and that process you mined through that data mining 
is based on anything that's going to be sustainable. It may not be. So it's very difficult to know when to continue to trade something or not trade something if you haven't used the scientific method to develop it. Mike, the numbers of people that email me, just random people wanting to gather information about trading or investing, the numbers of people that email me and say, you know, this is my particular challenge, the response that I've developed is to ask, what is your method and what is your time frame? 90% of the people, and I got a lot of people from all around the world, 90% of the people will write me back and say they're trading a five minute bar. And I'm just thinking, how is the average, the average, and these are just average folks. These are definitely not quant folks. Perhaps a lot of them are beginners, but I find it amazing. And I can't imagine that you would say this is a wise strategy, but it just seems like a really difficult road to hoe for people out there that are thinking it's going to be less risky. I'm going to trade five minute bars. And have you guys pondered, I'm not talking to you, I'm saying hypothetically, have you guys pondered who you're competing against? Who are you competing against if you're going to be trading five minute bars? You can get an idea by reading the books out there that are interviewing different traders. <laughs> Some of these quant guys that are looking at shorter term trading or high frequency trading, for example, it feels good. And that's something that is very difficult with investing is that people often do something because it feels good. Short term trading feels good because you get immediate gratification when you're right. On the loss side, you're taking a little bit of loss here and there. So it's not damaging to your ego, or your psyche. The issue is that short-term trading, especially, it's almost impossible to overcome those transaction costs for your, your average guy on the street. Most of, a lot of what I see in those traders, some of them are swing trading with momentum, but there's a lot of them also that have a tendency to, for example, buy something. They have more of an asymmetric price skew that they'll hang on a little bit. If it goes against them, they wait for it to come back and they're high percentage trades. High percentage trades, all they need is that one knockout punch where most of the time they work. You can take a little bit out each time it works. And when it doesn't work, you might lose a little more, but you're not getting destroyed. But there will always come a time when you do. That's one of the flaws I see in some of these short-term strategies that have been out there. The classic, I'm going to go pick up all those nickels in front of the steamroller. Exactly. If you were to advise people right now, and I'm speaking generally because we're not giving investment advice here, but just advising people to think about this philosophically. Let's say they are 100% in on equities. They're loaded up. Perhaps they're feeling, well, yeah, I'm listening to Mike and Mike, and this sounds pragmatic and whatnot, but they're thinking, gosh, if I start selling right now, I'm going to get a tax hit. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. And then they got the fear of missing out. How would you want people to think about if we're coming into one of these periods, the big if, if we're coming into one of these periods where the current equity bear in the US, maybe it goes to crash level, maybe it goes minus 50% at some stage of the game here, coming into this fall of 2022, it feels a touch ominous. How would you recommend people to think about protecting themselves from a bear if they're all in on equities from a buy and hold approach right now? So this is something that goes back about Three years, in 2019, we were engaged by a family office to work with them on a, a large position they had in their portfolio, a long equity position, and establish whether there were ways that we could help them protect that. We took something that I had been thinking about for a while, and we created a strategy that we call risk replacement. What this does, and it's interesting, because what it does is give people the ability of protecting the downside with put options, but paying for the cost of that put options, potentially through time with this return driver portfolio, essentially another portfolio that's trading really broad baskets. So again, modern portfolio theory, more broadly you're diversified, lower your risk, looking at these non-traditional ways of making money. And that's what the return driver diversifier is. What we do with those people is we give them the ability of having 100% equity exposure still, protect it with the put protection. So we've offset that risk and replace that risk with the risk of the return driver diversifier, which is substantially less than just owning stocks because stocks are fairly monolithic. On the way up, you'll see stocks on correlated with each other moving differently. But when the market falls, you get just high correlations, everything falls together. What this does is eliminate that risk because you've got essentially negative one correlation with a put protection on it, offsetting that. 
And then this return drive diversifier doesn't have to make as much money as the stock market. It just has to pay for the cost of the puts and it can be more broadly diversified. This is something that we think is going to be taken up more and more by investors over the years when they start recognizing that through risk replacement, you can have the exposure on the long side to equities, but have the risk of a broadly far more diversified portfolio and essentially replacing that high risk with low risk and still retain that upside performance. That's one of the things that we're, we're talking to a lot of people about. We've created a collective investment trust for 401k plans for that, We've got funds for that. We do manage accounts. It's just something that I think is going to be copied over the next five, 10 years until you see a lot of it in the marketplace. What I like about that description and how you sound, you sound like a CPA who just sat down at his desk and said, okay, there's this scenario, this problem that I see out in the marketplace, this one that a lot of investors are facing. How can we look about giving them an option, giving them a way to protect their downside? I think that the interesting thing about the way you say it is just, you're so even keeled. You're so even keeled. Whereas you can feel for most investors, they don't have that. Why do you have that? Where did you get it from? Who taught you? Why do you have it? I want to know. What's the answer? <laughs> Besides 40 years of experience, I want to know why Mike is even keeled. I don't know if there's anything other than the 40 years of experience. <laughs> it's really just getting beaten up enough by not being that way. And believe me, I've done it multiple times. And people say, uh, do something once, shame on you type of thing, twice shame on me. Well, I've got multiple shames on me. I have more often than I care to talk about, not exactly done what I knew at the, that moment was the rational thing to do. It's a difficult battle. I'm constantly fighting. The way that I am able in actual practice trading to fight that is by being systematic. Across my life, though, my life isn't totally systematic. So I will still make decisions that are based on some sort of an emotion or an ego basis that turn out over time so rewarding. But overall tend to be more detrimental than accretive financially. I think just learning through experience and getting beaten up enough, seeing it in other people as well, caused me to come up with approaches that are as systematic as they can possibly be. Okay. So let me take this back in time. I think I saw you speak in person for the first time in 1994 or 95 in Chicago at either an FIA or MFA event. I think I also have somewhere in my collection of stuff, audio tapes from you giving presentations, I want to say in the 90 to 92 time period. That's not yesterday. I got to tell you, I got to tell the audience, you sound exactly the same, Mike. <laughs> you sound just as even keeled 25, 30 years ago as you do today. What about in 1982? How did you sound in 1982? How do you think you sounded then? It may be that I just handle the stress of making a mistake in the surface environment, handle it, handle it well. I realized early on that there was no advantage to essentially wearing the emotions on the sleeve and letting them take any more control than they wanted to already in my life and the way I manage things. I probably, maybe from the beginning was a little bit that way, but I have absolutely trained myself to be that way because it lets me step back and think on a rational basis when... Internally, I'm starting to get very emotional. I know I don't want that to surface and affect my behavior. There's one tape I have to find. We're having this conversation. You might even remember, but I can't remember who was on the panel with you, but you were on it. And I want to say it was either like a Tom Basso or Pierre, who was with Dunn Capital at the time. There was somebody from Campbell, maybe Bill Eckhart, maybe Jack Schwager. I got three of the four probably right in that group but it was the most interesting panel. You guys, it's the kind of panels that young people don't get a chance to see in person today. I think there was a John Henry guy on the panel too. Man, I love that kind of stuff. You guys were so direct and so honest and straightforward. I think today, maybe from the success of all those kinds of events, there's less and less events where really bright minds will get out there and just have these kind of like intellectual philosophical conversations about the nitty gritty versus a lot of times people are just selling something. Right. I believe what you're referring to was in the mid-90s, and I think it was an FIA conference that I was moderating the panel. We had some great people I was able to bring onto that panel. 
all very successful traders or researchers. But what was interesting, I found too, is that there was a reasonable amount of disagreement. There was a lot of agreement, but there was some disagreement as far as, for example, timing a strategy. When do you give up on something? When do you say, hey, now it hasn't been performing, it's even a better time to invest in that strategy, for example. It was a great panel because it was filled with some really bright and experienced people at that time. They were all systematic, research-driven investors. This was just literally on an audio cassette, the way it was recorded. I'm going to have to go through my Dropbox and see if I have it. I think we're far enough away that I don't think anybody would get mad about copyright stuff today. I can remember a lot of it. I ended up quoting several passages from it for assorted books. It was timeless. If we were to listen to it today, it'd be timeless. I would probably agree that without hearing it, just from my memory, because I don't think a lot has changed in what those people have done. My philosophy was pretty well locked in by then as well. So I think it probably is valid today as it was then. Mike, cool stuff. I appreciate you for always joining me and sharing. Again, I feel like I'm very calm right now. I, I, I'm, I'm very, you've got me very calm. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I can do that <laughs> without putting you to sleep. Mike, where can we send people? Brandywine.com is one place, right? Is there anywhere else? Your books, uh, Jackass Investing, they can find that on Amazon. They can find that. They can write brandywine.com. Our latest funds, we have a video out there, brandywineprotectedfunds.com. People can go and see a three-minute video of what we're talking about with the Brandywine Protected programs that we're doing as well. Mike, cool stuff. I hope you will keep joining me in the future. I always enjoy. Oh, I really appreciate your invitation, Mike. Thanks. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.